Good afternoon and welcome to Connecting Communities. Today's webinar is a year of crisis and now what? Where our main streets go from here? On slide two, I would now like to take the time to introduce our speakers for today. Alfreda Norman, Senior Vice President from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Suzanne Anardi, CEO of Rural Community Assistance Corporation. Elmi Bermejo, owner of Tommy's Mexican Restaurant. John Chen, Executive Director at Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation. Gary Woods, former chairman of the Oklahoma City Black Chamber of Commerce. And I'm Matushka Lindo Briggs, Director of Special Projects and Strategic Support for the Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And I will serve as your moderator for our session today. Let's move to slide three, where we can take care of a few housekeeping items before we get started. So for the best webinar experience, we recommend you use the web stream to consume this live video event through your computer speakers. If you have technical issues, you're welcome to dial into the phone number posted on the player page, but the video will not sync perfectly with the phone audio. This session will be recorded and the presentation will be available on our Connecting Communities website. Also, in connection with the session, you can find a variety of additional resources on today's topic available at www.bedcommunities.org. We will be taking audience questions during the event and we'd love to hear from you. To submit a question, use the Ask Question button located on the webinar player page or you can email us at communities at stls.frb.org. As we move to slide four, I need to roll over our legal notice and disclaimer since this is a Fed webinar, which is that the opinions and statements expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and are not intended only for informational purposes. They do not reflect official positions of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, or the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And finally, our mission on slide five. The mission of the Federal Reserve's community development function is to promote economic growth and financial stability for low to moderate income individuals and communities. You can look at the map to see where your community development team is located. Our work is done through a range of activities from conducting research and identifying emerging issues, to developing resources and sharing ideas, and lastly, fostering collaboration and building partnerships. So before I hand the reins over, we would like to have our audience answer a polling question. So let's get that polling question up there. Should see it here in just a second. The first question is gonna be on there and all you have to do is click on it. And here we go. Has the pandemic influenced you to visit small businesses more often? You can click yes or no. We'll give you all about 20 seconds here to answer that question. All righty. I think we have quite a bit coming in here. Yes or no, and then don't forget to hit submit as well. Okay, Dave, you want to go ahead and show those results? Wow, 81%. That's great. 81% say yes, that the pandemic has influenced um, them to visit small businesses more often. So that's great to hear, and I'm sure our panelists are excited to hear that. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Alfreda Norman from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Alfreda, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Matisha. <laughs> Happy to be part of the Connecting Communities event. At the Dallas Fed, I have responsibilities for the bank's communications and public outreach. This includes our community development function. The community development function plays an integral role, as Matushka just said, in promoting economic growth and financial stability for low and moderate income communities and individuals. CD staff 
conduct research, share information and resources, and work with community partners to address economic challenges and opportunities. The Fed is engaged in this work because an inclusive economy is good for the nation. We have stable communities. If we have stable communities, we'll have stable regions and a more robust economy overall. We know most folks, including community development professionals, are unaware of the Dallas Fed or the Dallas Fed or the Fed's, the 12 Reserve Bank's work in underserved communities across the nation. So we've launched our community, our Fed Communities Initiative to amplify this work and to give professionals engaged in any facet of community development easy access to the Fed's research, data, tools, and expertise. You can find out more at fedcommunities.org. Explore what's there, meet some of our experts, and sign up to see what comes next. In fact, our stories of resiliency on fedcommunities.org is what led us to our event today. We can all likely remember the specific date a year ago when life changed in a dramatic fashion. You began working remotely, or you had to work with personal protective equipment to order, to, in order to be safe. Your service organization saw requests for help skyrocket. Your kids' school began doing remote learning. Toilet paper was rationed by grocery stores. Everyone began wearing masks, and life as we knew it was altered in ways that no one imagined. Along these uh, challenges um, came devastating life, health, and economic impacts um, on people across, across the world. Here in the United States, we saw a disproportionately larger impact on Black and Hispanic people, a higher death toll from COVID-19, greater exposure to the disease through public-facing essential service roles, including hospital, transit, and food production professions. And more jobs were lost among lower paying service roles, roles which are historically filled by black, brown and immigrant workers. The pan pandemic also wrought life altering impacts on minority owned small businesses. We all know this progression from the pandemic's first six months in the United States. Non-essential businesses were forced to close their doors. Not long after many were allowed to reopen under strict new operating requirements requirements that could prove very costly to business owners. In some states, these businesses were forced to shutter a second time. Many small businesses never reopened. Among Black and small business, small business owners, 40% closed their doors for good. Last fall, the Fed conducted its annual small business credit survey. This survey gathers input from small business owners across the United States on their experiences accessing credit. A new report based on this data comes out April 15th with findings on firms owned by people of color. Among other key findings, the researchers identified these takeaways. Firms owned by people of color, both small employer firms and sole proprietors were most likely to, be ex to experience operational and financial challenges stemming from the pandemic. 67% of Asian and black owned firms reported reducing their operations followed by 63% of Hispanic-owned firms and 54% of white-owned firms. Firms owned by people of color, and particularly Black-owned firms, were less likely to receive all of the PPP funding that they requested. And finally, the survey found that firms owned by people of color tend to have weaker banking relationships, experience worse outcomes on credit applications, and are more reliant on personal funds. At a time when everyone was struggling, where did minority small business owners turn for help? There is an arm of the financial service industry that plays a significant outsized role in getting capital to underserved areas. Perhaps you know them well. Community Development Financial Institutions, or CDFIs, are nonprofit mission-driven financial service firms supported by the U.S. Treasury. They provide loans and grants to residents, nonprofits, and small businesses operating in low and moderate income areas, rural areas, and majority minority communities. Like CDFIs, minority depository institutions or MDIs are also critical conduits of loans and financial services in these communities. Together, they account for less than 2% of the capital that supports small businesses nationwide. Yet in the past year, 
These organizations were the critical lifeline for many minority small owner business owners. Today, you'll hear directly from a small business owner and organizations that support minority businesses. Their stories are featured on fedcommunities.org. Today, we'll get an update on how they're faring and what they need going forward in order to survive and thrive. We'll start with a short video to hear from our panelists, and then we'll move into our discussion. And of course, we'll leave plenty of time for you and your, and your questions. So thanks again for joining us. Let's take a look at this video. I was watching the news that evening, uh, and they announced that the Sacramento Kings game had been stopped. I knew at that moment that COVID would be life altering for our CAC, our communities, nation, and world. The first thing I saw was when the death rates due to COVID-19 infection um, in America had surpassed some of the lesser developed countries. Whole industries began to shut down. And as a result of it, we saw a significant spike in unemployment and we saw small businesses begin to decline. What really, really tugged at my heartstrings is those people that we serve in our community, those who have um, experienced death and health um, impacts due to the COVID-19 virus. We're talking about small business owners who make a living, a livelihood from their business and use those revenues to support themselves and their families. Being able to see how communities have suffered, also recognizing and seeing that there still are some issues with institutional racism. Rural and native communities are often late to experience economic and health crises when there's a disaster or when there's obviously a pandemic. They also face major challenges and hurdles for recovery, and it often takes longer. There will be less face-to-face, -face, although we know we have to go back to face-to-face -face services. It will be a blend of face-to-face -face and virtual services. It has forced us to uh, become more tech savvy. But most importantly, uh, the impact is going to be in economics, the economics of people's lives. The pandemic has revealed to a lot of small business owners like myself and also the small business owners that I work with uh, in my role with the chamber, the need for innovation the need for diversity in terms of delivery of services. Find your compass, your baseline. What do you want to be able to say you accomplished at the end of this journey? Be flexible. Things are going to ebb and flow. You know, things open, they close. The best defense is a good offense. Don't wait for trouble to travel the whole way. No playbook, no operating manual can prepare you for such an event. We have to rely on our gut instincts. We have to rely on our experience to guide us through this and be an organization that's here to serve our constituents in the best way that we can. Let's meet our panelists. Let's start with you, Suzanne. Suzanne Arnardi, if you could turn your camera on. Suzanne is the CEO of Rural Community Assistant Corporation, a CDFI based in West Sacramento, California. During the pandemic, the Rural Community Assistance Corporation was a lifeline for small business owners across 13 Western states. So Suzanne, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your work. Our yeah, CAC, now we can hear you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, our CAC is uh, a regional CDFI. We serve the rural West, 13 Western states, including Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, we are a training and technical assistance organization. Uh, we do water and wastewater in small rural communities. We have a building rural economies model. We also are um, very involved in housing 
And then we have our core CDFI lending uh, arm. We have about 190 million in our portfolio of CDFI loans. Um, you know, during the pandemic, um, we, we are a training organization. So we immediately pivoted to uh, virtual trainings. We do nearly 500 of those a year. Uh, which was a, a big pivot for us, but which also increased our reach, which was interesting. We raised uh, $26.5 million in 0% capital so that we could support a PPP lending program. Uh, we developed foreclosure and eviction prevention trainings, also PPE usage trainings for our small water and wastewater operators. Um, and then we also developed uh, a training curriculum for PPP borrowers so that they could maximize the forgiveness on their PPP loans. So the instant they got a loan, they also got training on how to maximize that. Thank you, Suzanne. I now understand what it means to be a lifeline <laughs> to many, many organizations in your, in your part of the country. Thanks so much. Um, next, I'm going to ask for Elmi, if you could turn your camera on. Elmi? Bermejo is the owner of Tommy's Mexican restaurant based in San Francisco. Elmi, tell us about your restaurant and how were you impacted during COVID? Thank you, Alfreda, for this opportunity. Tommy's Mexican restaurant is located in San Francisco and is family owned for the last, my parents started 55 years. And to be clear, my mom is the technical owner of Tommy's. We all work for her. Um, she's 86 uh, years uh, young and still going strong. And it is a restaurant that is not in a typical area where you would think most Mexican restaurants open and operate because uh, most people would say, well, how come you're not in the Mission District in San Francisco? And my dad had this saying, he goes, why am I going to sell tacos to Mexicans? I want to explore new markets. So we were in an area with our Russian neighbors, our Asian Pacific Islander neighbors, uh, teaching the world about tequila. And so we are the recognized for our Tommy's Margarita and the restaurant has gotten some awards uh, for the bar, for the tequila that was developed, uh, the, rather the margarita. We have very many loyal customers and we're also a neighborhood place where lots of people come with their families. People have come, you know, when they were dating, now they're bringing their kids, now they're bringing their friends. So it's a sense of community. And when the pandemic hit, it was like shutting your, your community center down in a way because a lot of people would just come there just we, we do know most people's names. We know their stories. And that's what a neighborhood place is that also has a global following. And as a result of that, you know, we had to cut hours. We had to, all of a sudden, you went from being in the hospitality industry to saying to people, stand back, six feet apart, wear your mask, and being more of a police officer person or enforcement individual than more of a hospitality. And I see those changes um, that are happening. And so that impacted us. Our sales went, you know, plummeted. We generally were doing on a slow day, maybe three, $3,500 a day to 7,000 or more. Cinco de Mayo is our big day. And of course we didn't have that. And it went to some days, $335 a day. So you yeah. have to figure out what are you going to do to stay afloat? And how are you going to worry about the people who work there who have families to feed as well? So. Wow. Well, I understand that you're, um, you went to your bank to get a little bit of, of assistance with um, to maybe to no avail, but you did go to a minority deposit institution yes. and got a PPP loan. So Yes, we did. And we, have, we were with a very big bank for many, many, many years. And you would assume that, oh, I've been a good customer. I've you know, made my payments on time, done everything you're supposed to do to demonstrate you're a good customer and should be trusted. And we were told, just go to the website. And my mom and my family, this is sort of where I stepped in, is that they weren't doing online banking. And through a good friend, I was talking, lamenting the fact that, oh, this is, I had no idea that this would be the case. He, um, you know, talked to me about East West Bank and I called them. They could have not been more helpful. This friend of mine connected me and they made the process very easy and user-friendly and basically held our hand through the process. And that was, I, I really don't know where we would be without that, honestly. 
Well, thanks, Emily. I'm, I've, I've got uh, the, the restaurant on my list. When I'm in San Francisco next, I'm going to go. Where's Margarita? So that's two. <laughs> All right. So we've heard from Suzanne, which, um, and we're going to hear more from her about CDFIs. And then we've heard from Elmi. And uh, fortunately, she was able to get some help from her M- a, a, a minority deposit institution. So uh, more to come on, on that. So thank you, Elmi. Next up, John, if you could turn your camera on. Hi, John. John Chin is the executive director of the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation, uh, a nonprofit that supports residents and businesses in a 25 block service area of Philadelphia's Chinatown. And uh, tell us a little bit about um, PCD uh, and what, kind of, what what happened when 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 COVID struck. Yeah, um, when COVID struck, it was almost like someone shut off the water faucet to the flow of cash money. And as I was listening to Elmi, I, I thought she was talking about the businesses in Chinatown here in Philadelphia, because many of the businesses experienced the same challenges um, that she was describing. Uh, our organization, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we've been here 54 years in Chinatown. Uh, I would say that most of our work focused and, uh, on serving residents and their social service issues, more than 50%. But the day the uh, government shutdown occurred in March of 2020, we found oursel- our, ourselves shut down. So how would we serve the commercial core and the businesses and the residents in our community, which numbers about 8,000 residents and over 300 businesses in our Chinatown? Well, we quickly realized that we had to pivot our operations. We had to go onto the inter- internet online and uh, teach ourselves how to become social media savvy and uh, we understood that there would be a deluge of um, pleas for help coming to our organization from the small businesses, as well as the unemployed workers that were um, uh, just shut out from work because everyone closed. What we did is we created workshops online. Uh, our, our strategy was let's give information to those who we think can help themselves, basically a do-it-yourself approach. And that would uh, alleviate a lot of those one-on-one cases that we would have to handle directly. And that worked really well. Um, As information came out from the city government on the pandemic, within 24 hours, we translated everything into Chinese because the government didn't have that capacity at that time. We thought that was important. All the work that we did, the webinars, the flyers, the social media posts, everything was done bilingually. And the challenge in our community is not only do we have Chinese language, but we have Chinese Mandarin and Chinese Cantonese as the primary languages. So um, all of our staff were um, reassigned and given new assignments. And the focus was to triage all the crises that um, our small businesses were experiencing. Uh, So that's how we approached the pandemic. And I think our upfront um, strategic organizational restructuring really helped us to better serve the businesses. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Can't wait to to learn a little bit more. Just a second to dig a little bit deeper into that. Thanks, John, for uh, giving us a, a little bit of a an idea about what your organization did. Um, finally, let's ask Gary to turn on his camera. Um, Gary Woods, former chairman of the Oklahoma City Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, Gary, I was went on the website to look up the chamber and I, I like what I was reading about um, your motto, which is to you stand for equal opportunities and equitable outcomes for businesses, business owners of all backgrounds, um, particularly you're the black chamber of commerce. And so I know that you're very much concerned with the African-American businesses. Tell us a little bit about um, what happened uh, in Oklahoma city and how you all supported businesses during the pandemic when the pandemic struck last March. First of all, Frida, I really appreciate you highlighting the fact that, you know, we support all businesses of various backgrounds, uh, even though we're the Oklahoma City Black Chamber of Commerce, anyone who has an interest in doing business or has an interest in investing in the African-American community, uh, be it black or brown, you know, we, we like to always say that we love everyone. Uh, we, we are supporting anyone who's really wanting to take the next step and empowerment. And so when the pandemic struck our community and then struck our neighbors, um, the first thing that, that 
that came to my mind and to my board's mind at that time was, is how are we going to help and what network do we have from a banking slash PPP perspective to where we could provide some guidance and direction for those who were seeking information. And so, and at the same time, like some of the other uh, speakers on the panel, uh, we had to shut down our own office space and had to also begin to work remotely uh, and provide that support. And so we immediately began developing a network of lenders who were participating in the program. Needless to say, there were also a number of lenders who had, had not done anything in support of the PPP program. It, and it almost seemed as if they didn't have any interest, but we immediately began to start talking to our membership as well as those who were seeking information about thinking differently, doing things differently as it relates to their business, as it relates to diversifying, and then also to reevaluating their corporate structure in terms of, of how they set up or establish their business, as well as banking relationships. Uh, that was just so vital because, as you said earlier, people had relationships with a bank, but that bank wasn't necessarily interested in administering the PPP program. So they had to scramble and find other lending institutions who were willing uh, to help them. So we had our hands full <laughs> in, in, in trying to help support as well as to get our membership to think differently and also forge through that anxiety of not having relationships with lending institutions and have them aggressively seek out those relationships. Wow, thank you, Gary. And um, I've, I've got a few follow-up questions to that in just a minute. I'm gonna ask all the panelists to turn your cameras on and join us. Let's, this is the fun part. Let's, let's have a conversation. I've got some questions teed up and I hope our audience has got some as well. I think they're coming in and, and feel free to um, put your questions in and be ready at, at the end of our time to talk even more broadly with our... Um, so I wanted to ask, <laughs> I'm gonna ask this of all of you, um, do you see light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> in all of this or do you feel like we're still pretty much in a nightmare? Um, thanks. So I'm going to um, sort of start and, and answer this question. Um, the answer is yes. I think early on at, during the pandemic at the beginning and even late last year, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, for small businesses. Um, you know, in Philadelphia, um, you know, we, we follow the health department's regulations and uh, criteria. And there were some starts and stops. Uh, just when businesses thought um, and the health department tried to reopen, all of a sudden, the surge in the pandemic, uh, the surge in COVID rose, and then businesses quickly closed. This uncertainty caused a lot of expenses for small businesses, um, investing in a, in a startup, uh, reopening. So, but here we are, uh, vaccinations are going, and I think uh, businesses are feeling more confident, and we're seeing a lot more um, pedestrian activity on the streets in Chinatown and, and throughout Philadelphia. So I, I think with the certainty, businesses are better able to plan uh, for uh, business reopening, but also plan for the financial needs. Um, and that's that's uh, that's always been the challenge is where would businesses get their funds from to stay open and to uh, reopen? Yeah, Suzanne, I'm wondering what what are you thinking? Um, you know, I think one thing that happens in rural and indigenous communities is a lot of times if there's a disaster or pandemic, the impact is delayed, but it's also extended because the, the resources take longer to get there. Um, often, uh, you know, this is a, a point where scale really works against us because there's only a few small businesses. And if they're not reopening from a point of strength, then they're not catalyzing the rest of that rural community. And so I, I think we are, in the middle. One of the things about PPP lending this most recent round, a lot of folks elected not to make new, uh, to, to not to loan PPP to uh, new borrowers. We, um, we are accepting new borrowers. And one of the reasons is there are a lot, there's a lot, of, there was a lot of fear, um, mistrust, misunderstanding about taking on additional debt during this time. 
uh, particularly in rural communities. They're not about debt. And so they, they passed on the first few opportunities, but now it's been so long and they are, they are in dire straits. So we are taking new borrowers uh, in the PPP realm to help, uh, help keep them alive uh, as, as we see what, what the future brings. Um, and I, I think we're, we are cautiously optimistic, but um, again, there's always a delayed reaction and response and recovery in uh, rural and indigenous communities. Yeah. Elmi, do you see light at the end of the tunnel or <laughs> are you still in, an oncoming in train? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do see light at the end of the tunnel, especially as more and more folks get vaccinated. And at Tommy's, we made a decision that well, San Francisco said, okay, you can start opening at 25%. And we waited, we just opened 25% last night because we wanted certainly everybody on the staff to be vaccinated because a lot of people, you only see what you see in your own bubble and people would walk in unvaccinated and walk in without a mask. So again, we're saying, well, you have been, but the, not everybody has been. So I do see that, 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 it, that uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think we still have to be cautiously optimistic. I know a, a restaurant that is a, a few blocks from Tommy's where they're wait, gonna wait 60 days. They said, we are don't want it to be closed down again in the up and down in uh, of businesses. So people are watching and small businesses were talking to each other about how it's going for them and sort of keeping each other, uh, helping each other out about what we see and how we continue to help one another. But I think that the more, if more people get vaccinated and understand that they have to continue to wear a mask and be a little bit, practice physical distancing and be a little bit mindful of your neighbor. I think that we, you know, the, the economy is going to pick up a lot more and it'll be really great for small businesses. And what I also find is that people are very uh, supportive of those ideas because I thought, oh, they're going to just say, why do I have to wear a mask? But they also want us to stay open. And we've had uh, customers who come and say, I just came to get a couple of things. I want to make sure you're still open. And that's very heartwarming to see that the community or, or people who are used to coming to Tommy's want us to be open. They want to see small businesses thrive and they're willing to do what it takes to make sure that that happens. And that's very positive. Eric, what do you, what are you thinking in, um, in your neck of the woods? How's it feeling? Yeah. yeah. Um, I do see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'm encouraged by it because as a, as a community, as a nation, we've learned to kind of adjust and grow through the pandemic and, and learn how to operate. It, it's, it's forced us uh, as a nation and as a community to expand and take on, you know, new skill sets and look at our businesses differently. However, there's two sides to that coin, right? Um, when you think about, you know, what happened initially and, and when you think about the types of businesses that are the most vulnerable, those that actually exist on the discretionary incomes of other citizens in the community, you know, some of them were the most vulnerable and hardest hit. And so as a result of it, you know, as Elmi was saying, some people will come by just to see if the business is still open. And that's a very, very real thing because so many of them close their doors and they're not reopening. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is, is the other side of the coin because also, too, there's a race against the clock in terms of how long can we survive, you know, uh, without having the needed support to keep the doors open. And the pandemic didn't hit every business at the same time in the same way. There were different waves that hit businesses differently. And so if you didn't have the cash reserves or a line of credit, or if you're in process of a PPP loan, as an example, uh, with a lending institution and it's delayed, you still have obligations and bills and things of that nature that are stacking up. And so you have to start making crucial business decisions as to how long can I withstand this as a business owner? Um, and, and then when you project that out to how that impacts a community, you know, it, again, that other side of the coin is not always pretty. I mean, it leaves behind a trail of things that have to be cleaned up 
as we try to continue to push towards that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, I'm switching metaphors and I'm going to be talking. I think we all agree that we're in the last mile, right? So, so to the, to the, to this thing called poster after, um, COVID. And I'm wondering, um, Elmi, as a small business owner, what do you need now? Um, and who can or should provide assistance or, or help? Well, I, I think that there's, um, also love what the, you know, what Gary and John are talking about in terms of assisting and also Suzanne, because I think there's also a lot of now I think small businesses need to educate themselves so that we don't find ourselves in the same position. So what did we learn from this? How do we strengthen those relationships with lending institutions, knowing about how organizations work? And I, when my dad started Tommy's and there was a chamber of commerce, he was I found out he was one of the founders of the Greater Gary Merchants Association. And I said he was. He wasn't really a joiner, but they said that he said, you need help? I'll give you a little money, but I don't attend meetings. I got to run my business. So I think we have to balance that. How do we make sure that folks are learning about tools and how to uh, stay um well, relevant in a way and also continue uh, thriving as a small business owner while informing ourselves about other services and other products that can be helpful. And I think also uh, very lucky that in San Francisco at Tommy's, we have very loyal folks, loyal, loyal followers, and that that has been very helpful. And I think also the patients that you need to move forward about how do we navigate this pandemic because it hasn't really gone away. And so it's balancing all of these different things to continue to move forward and to thrive. Hmm. Good advice there. I'm wondering, Gary, John, and Suzanne, from your vantage point, um, what do small businesses and entrepreneurs need now? And, um, and, and who and should or can provide it? So one of the things that we we incorporated over this period of time is we have a building rural economies for entrepreneurs and small communities, but we added business coaching and the business coaching role has really blossomed. Um, not only are, are we working with our entrepreneurs that we were working with previously, but the loan fund is accessing coaching for our, our, our borrowers through our CDFI. And we also um, developed a, what we call the relief fund. It's, it's a grant funded re-emerging loan fund that is, can be creative and patient capital to help folks re-emerge into their markets from a, peer, from a pace, place of strength versus weak. And so with that comes business coaching. It's, it's you know, an average of $25,000 of, of lending of loan money coupled with the business coaching. We find that a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs um, much like my colleagues here have talked about the open close, spend money, the, the bills keep coming and, and, you know, everything's delayed or not coming, revenue's not coming in. So uh, we supply two, we add two uh, coaching sessions so that our borrowers for that fund and those business owners can think long term, can think past the alligators, right, that are right at their door, but think, how can I best invest these resources to help me sustain and, and reemerge um, from the crisis? So I think that's a really important thing to provide um, to, they are traumatized. It's, it's, been, it's been a really difficult road for them. So providing them with that guidance, I think, is critical. Um, and I also, before, I, I also think we have to start thinking about that lost revenue is not coming back. So providing grant and, you know, blends of funding has to happen. And we need partners to do that. The foundations have been great. You know, some of the banks have been great. But at the end of the day, that revenue is never coming back. And that hole has gotten deeper and deeper. So thinking about how we can support them in ways that are not traditional lending is really important in my mind. Yeah. Hey, Alfreda, can I add to Suzanne's comments? Please. You got me, you know, you, you hit on something that we spent a lot of time talking about at the chamber when we're talking about innovation or, or 
being more strategic in terms of your thinking. Business coaching is is so vitally important, uh, particularly in the African American community, because oftentimes our small businesses are a byproduct of extra income to support a family. So as an example, you may have a single mother who works a job, but don't have, don't make enough on her job. Uh, so she takes on an addition or starts a business doing something that is, you know, unique to her skill set, but it typically has a low entry uh, cost associated with it. And it's, it, it's used to supplement that income, but they don't seek out the necessary coaching to ensure that their business, because it legitimately is a business, it's not structured appropriately, and they don't have a strategic or business plan uh, for their business to help them survive setbacks like, you know, a pandemic or, or something like that. So when you have an individual or a family that is affected, not only in terms of their employment, you know, being laid off, but then on top of that, they're not able to make that additional supplemental income, it becomes devastating. And it's primarily just due to a lack of knowledge or, excuse me, or access to resources uh, to where they can kind of think differently about their business. And I'll give you an example of that. African-American restaurants in the African-American community, oftentimes they start out with Typically, without a bank loan, they use their own income to supplement their business venture. They open up their business. However, they don't think about the fact that, you know, problems will come and you definitely don't think about a pandemic that's going to last a year plus or even longer. So things such as perhaps expanding into like mobile meal type service, a, a drive up or drive through being able to leverage the internet to be able to place orders because so many uh, of the restaurants were closed due to uh, either some sort of executive order or under an order from our governor. And so as a result, they just kind of sat there. And in addition to that, they had to lay off some employees. So how does that business exist through that level of hardship? They have to reinvent themselves. And so, yeah. or they have to leverage of various uh, different diverse ways of servicing, whether it be connecting with a DoorDash type service or whether it be a mobile food truck where people can walk up so that they don't have to open up, you know, the, the doors to their restaurant and, and, and put people at risk. And so just this that sort of strategic thinking um, is gonna be vitally important. And then also too, while they were operating, seeking out a relationship with a lending institution that has a vested interest in supporting small businesses, as opposed to just going with the big name lending institutions who oftentimes would add to the frustration and the anxiety because let's just face it, most of businesses in African-American community you know, they start without a loan. There's no established credit with the lending institution. They do it. It's a bootstrap thing for most of these small businesses. And so how can you take someone who doesn't have a relationship with an institution, then all of a sudden tell them, go get a partnership with an institution? That's not even culturally yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Well, it's so true. So many of these things that you were discussing are were problems before the pandemic, right? Okay. And the pandemic has exasperated a bit, but it also creates a sense of urgency to know that, you you know, now, like, you really have to address some of these things because yeah. we don't know what's around the corner. Um, John, I'm wondering what you're thinking about kind of what your business, I like, you know, you residents, I mean, individuals and businesses, when it comes to small businesses, there's a fine line between um, my family and my business, like, you know, it's, sometimes it blurs, <laughs> right? Like, you know, you know that. Um, yeah. So if your business is struggling, you know, obviously it's, it really hits kind of your, your kitchen table, your dining room table kind of, you know, or, or what's happening. So John, I'm just wondering what, what reflections might you have on what, what, what are the needs now for your small business uh, folks in Philadelphia? 
Yeah, um, all the comments that I heard are spot on. And uh, what you just mentioned, so uh, my parents ran a, a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown. So at the age of seven, I found myself working there. And you're very right. The family, the small business is the family business and that's the, the revenue stream that's gonna support our family. And um, this isn't a, a, a finger pointing, but it's just a fact, a matter of fact that many of the small businesses were caught with their pants down because what I mean by that is when the economy is good, um, a business and the operations does not have to run efficiently, right? But who could have even predicted this year-long economic um, devastating, devastation that we're all experiencing? And in today's environment, um, Gary just mentioned this, we have to, our businesses have to figure out the social media marketing. Uh, their customer uh, are no longer cash-only businesses where people walk by to pick up their order or come in and dine, they have to be competing uh, on the internet regionally, okay? Uh, so that's where the uh, business um, uh, support and, and technical assistance is really important because our small businesses have to learn how to operate on the internet um, because yeah. I think the days of 100% um, passerby business is gone. And when I talk about operations and efficiency, I was talking to a restaurant business owner. Uh, he is now, he used to open 4 p.m. for a dinner dining hour till 4 a.m. That business for him is gone. He now opens for the lunch hour, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. So he has a very short period of time. He still has to pay a full kitchen staff and he still has to pay front of the house workers. Now, his food costs rose from 33% of his sales to 50%. Those delivery services that we all love to use, right? They can take anywhere from 15 to 30% of the sale. Mm. So he's got what 50, 45 to 50% of the remaining cash that he has to pay for everything else. There's no luxury and there's no, uh, there's no luxury for mistakes for these small businesses. So they need a lot of coaching in terms of how to better operate had a market on, on social media. And uh, number three, um, really understand their customer and their market because it's, it's really changed today. Yeah, well, man, you all just, that was for all listening. <laughs> that was a lot, of, a lot of good advice. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit um, because not only were we in the midst of a, a global pandemic, but we had some things happening from a social standpoint happening in our communities as well. And I'm wondering, this question is to all of you, how do you feel your communities are acknowledging sort of this significant inequality that, or inequity that is um, in America? And if so, can you give some specific examples? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I can tell you that during the initial rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program, um, we definitely saw a difference in terms of how um, certain businesses were being handled compared to others. Um, the the minority-owned businesses, number one, because they didn't necessarily have an established banking relationship. They were already on the outside. But also when you look at minority owned businesses, the majority of them have a tendency to be sole proprietors. Uh, and so as a part of the Paycheck Protection Program, there was a the first phase, they couldn't even apply for the, the PPP program for, during that first week. And that was problematic because oftentimes those businesses are most vulnerable and they need the help the most. But at the same time, we had some lending institutions who were basically taking the approach of, hey, let's look at our customer base. And it was almost a too big to fail kind of strategy. Um, you know, our big businesses, um, you know, with some of our larger banks, they were proactive in contacting and interacting 
with the larger corporations and, and getting them situated and set up. And in some is, in issues, I know in Oklahoma, we saw that there were significant funds being lended to some larger corporations to the tune of five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000, even as high as a million dollars when a small business owner couldn't get 10000 uh, let alone even get in line to get 10000 So that one week delay in, in having the ability to apply was problematic because again, you know, we're talking about people trying to survive a couple of months. I mean, some of these people were struggling, you know, almost a week. And then, of course, you're talking about the application process on top of that. So that sort of inequality was problematic. Um, and, and that was something that I was glad to see that there were changes being made with phase two. Um, and so that's just a byproduct of the fact that, number one, you know, we were learning, but in that phase one, it definitely appeared that there was more concern about Wall Street than Main Street. Mm. And Thanks, that <laughs> to me just stood out. I mean, like just just quickly, especially when you take in consideration that, you know, 99% of small businesses are going to be these small mom and pop shops and we were losing them you know, just in a matter of months, as many as more than 400,000 in like the first 60 days, you know, they were, they were shutting down. And so that was concerning for me. And it disproportionately affected black and brown businesses even more so. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Gary. I wanted to share what we were doing in San Francisco when it came to the social fabric, especially in the Latino community. And early on, a group of folks said, no one's going to help us. Uh, not with social things, not with, we have to do it ourselves. So the Latino Task Force on COVID-19 was established and uh, 30 CBOs, Unidos en Salud, Together in Health or United in, in, in for Health. And these folks, and I'm proud to be a member of that because it was a lot of community folks from small business owners, uh, service providers came together to say, what does the community need? food. So there's a food distribution testing. There's a testing site. In fact, the New York Times did an article about this. And then it was vaccines. But there are weekly meetings. And the woman who runs it, you get one second. If you don't have your thoughts together, she goes on to the next person because it's not a committee meeting. It's a report out meeting. What are you doing? What do you need? When do you need it? And how do we move forward? And it's been very successful. Um, and they've been, it's very cultural competent because you want to go to get your vaccine where you know folks, where you, if there is reticence about, well, I don't know about the vaccine, I'm concerned, people hear all kinds of weird stories. And you go to the community and there are people, not only that look like you, but that speak your language, are gonna help you. And, you know, from how to make the appointment to get vaccinated, to how to get in, to where you're gonna go. You can't get it here. We'll figure out how to get you to the next place that has that vaccine for you. And it's a way, it's a year old now, that just celebrated a year, but elected officials are also on that call to report what are they doing? What kind of small business funding does like the mayor have or the, does the community have? What can we do with the small business commission? What are, what do people need? And small businesses were talking to each other about what was needed, but it, it's become a resource point and has been very successful and very helpful to the Latino community in San Francisco. I mean, it, it's really amazing to, to see what has happened with the, with this group. Mm, kind of a proactive to make sure that you yes. got the piece of Not the pie that you needed to get to help. Save, yeah. our, <laughs> save ourselves. <laughs> John or Suzanne, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I, 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 something that from just a, a bit of a different tactic, um, you know, as a CDFI, we get investments and they have covenants. Right. And so while we we work really hard to serve indigenous communities, Native American, you know, Alaska Natives, Pacific Natives, um, it, it's sometimes hard to match our source of funds with the needs on the ground. Something really interesting with PPP which by the way, we had to go to three banks. So um, nonprofits were also in the inequitable distribution of PPP. So 
What was interesting to me is I have some really cool stats that if, if our loan fund could track like this normally, I would be a happy camper. But the SBA guarantee, this is what we were able to do, which the gap between what we do normally with traditional lending funds and what we were able to do with um, obviously the 0% money with the guarantee on it. 33% of our loans went to nonprofit organizations. 76% of our loans had less than 10 employees. 86% the loans were under 150,000. 47% were in persistent poverty counties, 21% in indigenous communities. And we saved you know, numerous jobs I think there's something to be learned here. I know for us, we're, we're, we were like, this is the, these are the stats I want. These are the stats, our mission, but there's a mismatch. And so as we think about um, cultural competency, as Almi talked about in our lending, um, there are different things. And I think everybody's mentioned it. There are different factors that have to be considered um, with small businesses, uh, black, brown, whatever, rural, I put them in that category too, that we need to, we need to be thinking about and um, we need to do that as a lending community uh, because those stats, I would, I would love to have those on our regular, but it, it was a different kind of capital that came in. So mm -hmm. I just share from an equity lens, that was a real eye-opener for us. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, yeah, there, there are inequities and there were inequities. Um, just in talking about the PPP loan. So if the strategy was to get the money out to the small businesses as quickly as possible, um, that definitely did happen. Uh, if the strategy was to make sure that it was spread uh, out evenly, that really didn't happen all that well in the first phase. I think uh, to Gary's point, they made adjustments and made huge improvements. Um, and the story about the small business approaching a very large bank, that happened here. Uh, I heard that many times and the, they never got a response back from the large bank, but we have uh, great community banks here in Chinatown. And even though the business was not a customer of the community bank, the community bank turned the loan around in less than three days. Okay, so, so that's a success story. And that is uh, where people and businesses and banks step in uh, because there is an inequity. Uh, the other inequity that we saw is that many of the small businesses, you know what, many of the loans, the PPP loans were about $4,000, not a lot of money. Um, but $4,000 is maybe a lot of money for that small business. So um, we've seen inequities in various phases of the pandemic and the PPP loan is just, it's just one, one type of inequity. Well, um, you know, some good nuggets from what you all said about sort of this post-covery, uh, post-COVID recovery and thinking about equitable recovery. And I think there's lessons learned in the distribution and PPP, right? So that there are things that we learned in that process. Um, Al Alfred, like you I said, Suzanne. Else out there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we were talking about you know, the, the, like for instance, you know, nonprofits, they were not uh, eligible in phase one, but they were able to be, they were eligible in phase two. The other group that is uh, one that, that I deal with all the time would be those individuals because of uh, mistakes in the past, the, if they were a, a convicted felon, they were also ineligible for, you know, the PPP program. And that was something of a concern because when you think about, you know, the incarceration rates and things of that nature and people come out of uh, prison or jail, many times uh, they cop a plea. So they never really even go to trial or court or anything. They're just trying their best to get out of this that bad situation, you know, and, and they can't get a job. So they start a business. And they start a business and they've paid their debt to society and they're out there running a good business, turning over a new leaf, trying to do the right thing. And then when it's time for assistance, they don't qualify because of a mistake in the past. 
And so I think I heard someone say that it is so vitally important that when we roll out programs like this, that we talk to Main Street and go into certain communities to try to find out. I think it was Suzanne, and I appreciate those comments, Suzanne, that you need to understand what does the small business economy in a particular area or in some of these metropolitan areas really look like in terms of who the business owners are, the types of backgrounds and what they're doing. They're, they're doing good. They're running a good business. They're doing the right thing. And a lot of them are employing people, you know, and, and maybe it's a, a strategic approach to how they structure their business that could help them in the long run. Or maybe we could have some considerations in how we roll out programs or in the bylaws of the program or whatever, guidance, guidance documents, whatever, that to where we don't exclude people who are really, really doing, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. At the end of the day, they're tax paying, you know, business owners just like everyone else. The only difference okay. is they made a mistake. Yeah. Good. Great point. Well, gosh, I could go on with lots more questions. But I think we, um, we've got an audience that I'm sure has had some questions. And so before we switch to our Q&A, I think, um, Matushka, we're going to go to some polling questions. That is right. Thank you, Alfreda. Okay, let's um, turn to some polling questions. We have two more that we want to ask, and then we're going to get to Q&A. Remember, uh, feel free to email us or use the Ask a Question. Um, to send in some questions. So the first polling question, have you lost a favorite local business to COVID? Yes or no? Please just go ahead and click on your screen and then don't forget to hit submit. I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds here to fill that out. Wait a minute, I think I asked the first polling question. So this one is, did the pandemic strengthen your town's sense of community? Did the pandemic strengthen your town's sense of community? Okay, let's go ahead and have the results. 80% said yes that the pandemic did strengthen their sound, their uh, town's sense of community. You know, that's kind of a positive way to look at all of this, wouldn't you say, Alfreda? Absolutely. All righty, let's go ahead and take that question down and go back to our first polling question that I was responding to, and that will be, have you lost a favorite local business to COVID? Yes or no? Please just go ahead and click on the screen and then hit submit. You know, I know here, um, I'm based out of St. Louis and we definitely, tried so hard to keep up with the carry out to make sure that we could keep um, some of our very favorite businesses here up and going. Okay, can we have the results of those? Seventy three percent said yes they did lose one of their favorite local businesses. So um, that's disheartening for sure. Thank you so much for all of you participating in our polls. It just helps us, helps the panelists, helps all of us, even as the audience, get an idea of what we're working with, what we've lost, where we need to go from here. So now let's go to questions. As a reminder, we are taking questions from our participants today. So we're live with the questions please submit them using the Ask a Question uh, panel. You can also email us at communities at STLS 
www.frb.org. So it looks like all the panelists do have um, their screens on and don't forget to go off mute to answer the questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, our first questions are um, not directed to anyone individually, but they're, um, they're pretty general. Uh, the first one is what are some of the creative programs that you see coming out to help vacant retail properties on Main Street? Anybody wanna to respond to that? And I guess the second part of that would be with the question is they also have, do you anticipate any significant physical changes to buildings where Main Street businesses are located as a result of the pandemic now and in the future? In the future? So basically anything related to the interior, exterior of businesses, also streetscape, You know, I'll say for, for Chinatown, the, um, the uh, small businesses really have small footprints in the interior. And uh, when the city at one point last fall opened up the opportunity to outdoor dining, uh, the opportunities for our corridor was, <laughs> Main Street was very, very limited. Um, so, uh, but there was one business that closed uh, last year, unfortunately. It was a uh, Chinese noodle manufacturing company. Uh, but one of the other businesses in the community saw that as an opportunity. So um, what they did was they rented the noodle business, but they didn't want the interior. They wanted the parking lot so that they could out open outdoor dining. So they opened up a beer garden in Chinatown for a brief period of time before it got really too cold in Philadelphia. So that was a very creative way to, to repurpose a, a business that closed. Anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, let's go to another question. And I think listening to many of you, especially um, Elmi, it makes other entrepreneurs think, okay, where do I go from here? So what is your best advice for starting up a new business at this time? Do your homework. I think that's the best advice. And certainly talking to the folks on this panel, you know, um, and hopefully re-listen to this, this uh, program because I think you'll get really great nuggets of information. But do, do your homework. And I, I mean, just as an example, a friend of mine said, I think I'll open a, uh, a bar. And I said, location, location, location. I said, because you have to be prepared now in your head to, okay, if things are going well, what if there's a pandemic? Do I need an outdoor garden? Is there a bus shelter right next to where I want to be? So those kinds of practical things where you think, well, I, I have to think about all the logistics. What does it look like inside? Is there a garden? Can I do a garden outside so people could sit down? So whatever business you in, it is doing your homework beforehand. And, you know, most of us with, in family-owned business, we just get an idea and we do it. And now you just have to a little bit more preparation, but also arming oneself with the tools for assistance and for advice and the business um, coaching um, that was discussed are all very helpful tools before. It's sort of like, just do some background. What do you need? What are the questions that you have to anticipate? And also don't just go to the first lending institution, compare and contrast. You know, what is going to work for you and what you, what kind of investments do you have to, and don't think of going big all at once. Sometimes right now, maybe it starts small and see if there's room for expansion as well, just so that you don't get, you not discouraged, but some, I think the economy is getting better, but it's going to take a while for us to get to where we were. And we have to be realistic about that. Elmi, you brought up great points there. And Gary, I just saw you open your mic because I think this is something that you touched on as well. Um, you know, how do you not only work with entrepreneurs, but how are you working with small businesses that maybe have never had relationships with financial institutions? How are you getting them to change their mindsets as well as how should entrepreneurs think about this? Was that a question for me? Absolutely. And anybody else who would like to take it. Yeah, so um, the reality is, is is this. I think it's, it's vitally important to have a, a relationship with a lending institution. I think it's important to have the relationship with the right one, uh, the one that, that basically fits 
your needs as a small business owner, but I think that's a part of your long-term strategy. So I would say that first things first, and adding to what Elmi is saying, um, think about your business. Is it a good time to open up a business? Yeah, it probably is because going to the question uh, before when they were talking about, hey, what opportunities perhaps exist with some actual uh, brick and mortar, uh, 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 you know, like structures to move into, you know, because of, of the economic downturn, I mean, there there are owners of a lot of those, um, uh, those, those restaurants or buildings or whatever, or strip malls, they're looking to make some deals right now because the vacancies are, are killing them. They don't, they don't want that vacancy. So they might make you an ideal uh, sort of, of lease agreement that would be beneficial for you. Also, there are some properties that are being managed or maintained by, you know, your local city or town. And that there may be some opportunities there as well, where they might perhaps, you know, have you, depending upon whether or not you're a nonprofit or whatever, you might have the opportunity to be able to get a property to, to at, at a very, very reduced cost. So those are things that you might want to look into. But also, too, when it comes to your business, be strategic and make sure that you have some flexibility in the type of business and how you choose to deploy your business. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in the Oklahoma City Black Chamber of Commerce, we have a chamber partner and an outdoor name out there is called her name was B and B catering. She had a banquet hall and it was purely a walk in banquet hall. And when the pandemic happened, then, you know, of course she had to shut down, but during that time, she took the opportunity to rethink and retool her business in such a way that she was able to relocate closer to the community in which she lived. That's number one. Number two, she was able to occupy a pizza hut, a vacant pizza hut that had closed down just prior to the pandemic, in which I'm assuming that she probably got the lease agreement uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost. It offered for her not only the facilities that she needed, but she was able to get a better parking lot. It had a drive through window and space for walk-up. In addition to that, she invested in a food truck. So now there are multiple ways that in the event a pandemic or something was to happen, she can still continue in one way, shape, or another, you know, to continue to operate her business. And then she looked at what she was offering in the way of food products. And, and she was able to tailor that to the community in which she served so that the business would have a predictable following or customer base. And so all of those were very, very strategic moves that she made. And in addition to that, she was also able to leverage technology, you know, uh, having her, her Facebook online uh, menu. And then also, if you had an iPhone, she had the scannable menu so that she could just, you could just go up with your iPhone and hit the, hit the little grid or the barcode there and the menu will come up on the phone. And, you know, so all of those things were just perfect examples of how you could level, leverage technology to make your business more convenient for your customers to continue to come and do business with you. Thank you for that, Gary. That was very helpful. I'm the only, the, I just want to add one thing in there is that also think about the trends that are going to be coming post COVID. I mean, think of, I mean, if you just had to think about it as a business person or an entrepreneur, what are people going to want to do when they come out again? And uh, I'll tell you, get, being with other people is going to be high on the list <laughs> going. <laughs> You know, what creative ways can you have outdoor play where people can play games? I mean, I think there's going to be such a yearning for gathering again. And so what kind of innovation and creative things can you, you know, can you think about when people want to do this again? So anyway, I just throw that out as thinking about future trends. Alfreda, that is such a good point, which also makes me wonder a question that I wanted to ask was, so, you know, after the 2008 recession, it seemed that it took a while for hiring activity to resume. How has hiring been, especially with all the new technology, with the new trends? How quickly are you seeing hiring picking up? 
in Chinatown, the, the hiring is slow uh, because uh, right now most restaurants are still only doing carry out. So the indoor dining is, is very, very limited. So, and you know, um, Chinatown has this basically own economy. The, the restaurants are, are purchasing from uh, distributors. Distributors are purchasing from manufacturers. So when the, when the business volume is not there uh, and the hiring affects all, all aspects of the uh, food industry here in Chinatown. Um, so it's, it's very slow. I would agree with that. I just wanted to add that I would agree with that hiring is slow because there's always this concern. You hear about the variance um, and what, where it's, it's predominant in what communities and you're just sort of waiting for that other shoe to drop maybe. So you're, you're cautiously optimistic and you just don't want to invest and then have to let people go. And, and so I think there's a little bit of a wait and see attitude and hopefully this stays the course. Okay, so this next question is from a government official. So um, they, what would you advise the government to do if we had this situation happen again? What could we do better? What we, did we do a terrible job of? I'd like to start with that. What I saw in terms of uh, programs, for instance, investing more in public health. There are no investments in public health, and you see that in different counties in California and how that plays out, that there are many challenges with broadband. I mean, in California, it's like, sign up for my turn. Some counties don't have broadband to do that. And not only investing um, in those kinds of things, but also when you look at services that predominantly impact uh, lower income communities, whether it's the employment development system that helps folks who have get their unemployment benefits, those um, kinds of investments haven't been made to keep up with technology. So then when you have this huge uh, downturn in the economy and people are applying for benefits, the system crashes. And I think those are the kinds of investments that are not a quick fix, but it's going to take a long-term and long-term investment to make sure that public health is, is a priority for folks because you see who falls through the cracks. It's a predominantly communities of color. So I think those have to, the, I, I think those are the things that each um, state needs to look at to figure out what kind of, of long-term investments, not quick fixes need to be made for social services and for the social safety net that we have, that should exist for things, times like these. Yeah, I would, I would so echo um, the infrastructure of all of the systems within the state and the federal government. And the other thing that I, I think is we forget, right? Like we had to redevelop a foreclosure prevention curriculum because nobody pays for that unless everybody's getting foreclosed on. And then it's like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. We got to fix this. And so thinking about, um, you know, we're, I, I think we're, we're so like, like squirrel. Oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do that. When, when there's this underlying, um, infrastructure that has to be in place for, you know, we have to plan for the good, the bad, and the really ugly, which I think we've been through. And so what, that's where the weaknesses immediately show up. The other thing I think is, is having an understanding of what it really looks like granular in, on a granular basis in a rural community, in an indigenous community, in a, a community of color in Chinatown. How do those folks get their information and who has the, the quickest access to them and bring them into the conversation way before there's a pandemic about the best way to transmit information, resources and support to them? Because it was, it is, it is a really difficult task to um, try to, you know, be in the middle of a crisis and trying to build those relationships and for, for govern the government to understand how those things flow um, in the midst of chaos, which is what we basically had. You know, some would say that the PPP program was a social program, right? It's a social program, like a social type safety net type program that we would view in the way of like a government sponsored like a Medicare or something like that. And 
one of the things that that kind of shocked me a little bit was that you know that program was administered through you know banks and would have liked to have seen some of that be administered it through other uh, uh, other groups, other organizations, uh, as opposed to it just coming, you know, right to you know our banks. Uh, the reason why is because when it was first rolled out, um, I have two friends who bank presidents slash owners, and you know, and I had conversations with them because you know we were beginning to network and try to figure out who was actually really interested in this and. What were their, you know, guidelines in terms of who they would lend to, et cetera, so that we could make references or referrals. And, you know, some some of the people internally at banks kind of felt like, you know, well, we don't know if we're going to do this or, you know, we're not quite sure, you know, of these regs and how to deploy them and things of that nature. And, you know, and I, of course, I, I got to say that we've never been through anything like this before. In, in recent history. So, I mean, you got to be reasonable from that standpoint as well. But now that we know, and also too, when we look back through history and we find that every 10 or 12 years, we have some sort of economic crisis. I think we need to probably begin thinking more about how do we support our people, our business owners, and, and I say people because ultimately that's who it affects. It affects families in, in, in our society so that, you know, we can better serve and do it quickly so that we don't have significant loss. Um, you know, and, and this is a very, very real thing because we have people who are losing jobs, who are losing health insurance in a pandemic. I mean, just let that sink in for a moment. People were losing jobs, losing their ability to afford or have insurance in a pandemic where people were dying. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think about that holistically in, in an approach to ensure that, you know, we, we do as much as we can to minimize the impact of, of economic downturns like this. Yeah, I, I think we all have to acknowledge that the government was running towards the fire with its pails of water trying to make up the rules as they were running towards the fire. Um, the one suggestion I think, um, or observation I, I would like to share is that um, when we talk about Main Street, whether it's urban or rural, we already know that the local communities know uh, which businesses work, which aren't working. And this is true of community banking. You know, the smaller banks better understand the commercial corridors. The larger banks are quite a bit far removed. So in anticipation of the next um, crises, I think government needs to think about all the assets that they have on the ground, these community-based organizations. If you can all run together towards the fire together, I think that will help reduce the amount of inequity that we saw. Because not only are you developing the rollout and the regulations, but you have all these different organizations and agencies that are in these communities, in the main streets, running with you and helping you develop the rollout um, on the ground. Thank you all for sharing that. So we have ju just about ran out of time here. I do want Suzanne to share um, about CDFI Week on the West Coast. I understand you're part of the California Coalition for Community Investments. Can you share a little more with us? Sure. Yeah, we're just finishing up our first ever uh, California CDFI week at the Capitol. Um, we're really excited. Uh, Senate Bill 625, which would establish California Investment and Innovation Fund, would create an ongoing partnership with CDFIs uh, to assist the state efficiently deploy resources to our communities in need. Um, communities of color, rural, urban, um, the entire gamut of who CDFI serves. So I think it, the bill represents a growing recognition by the public sector that CDFIs can be really valuable partners in providing uh, capital and resources to underserved communities. Good, bad, or ugly times, right? Um, so <laughs> I, I, I'm super excited. We're really excited, and it's been really successful. And um, just appreciate the opportunity to give them a shout out. That sounds good. 
Well, before we close the show, I would like to say, um, Alfreda, do you have uh, any final remarks for our audience? Well, I just want to, I appreciate everybody joining today. I hope you uh, enjoyed this conversation. I know I certainly did. And I really hope that you subscribe to fedcommunities.org to engage with the stories and resources from communities across the country, um, including the stories that we heard here today in, in more detail. If you haven't read those, they're on uh, fedcommunities.org. And also to support, to support small businesses in your community and learn which policies impact the community lenders that provide small businesses with much needed capital. Uh, and finally, tell a colleague about the Fed's work in the communities. Um, and um, I look forward to many more conversations like these in the future. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for sharing their time and stories with us. I would also like to thank, thank Alfreda for moderating, um, as well as all the participants that joined today um, in and out. We appreciate the time that you had for us and for our discussion on a year of crisis. And now what? where our main streets go from here. I think we got a lot of great information. A few reminders, we will have a recording available with an audio file on the Connecting Communities website and the Fed Communities website. We also welcome ideas for future recordings. We just shared a survey link if you joined us in the webinar and this same link will be distributed via email in a few minutes. We'd appreciate your feedback about today's session. Well, thank you for joining us. This concludes today's Connecting Communities webinar. Enjoy the rest of the day.